very happy to be here today. Um, and Ligres as well. So I'm going to talk about, well, I'm Ricardo Simon Carvajo. I'm the head of innovation and development at CEDAR. And today I'm going to talk about, uh, so what is Industry 4.0? Uh, so I'm going to just give an overview of what Industry 4.0 is, and then I will touch the area of predictive maintenance. How many of you have heard of predictive maintenance here? Uh -huh, okay, that's good, that's good. Okay, so it won't be that technical, and, um, but I will try to provide some detail of what we do. But before, allow me to introduce CEDAR, okay, which is the center where I work. So CEDAR is the National Technology Center for Applied Data Analytics Research. So the story about CEDAR was created around six years ago as a strategy from the government to help industry. So 15 centers were created, for example, one in pharma, another one in dairy, meat, ICT, cloud. So our center was in data analytics, sort of machine learning, statistics, all of that. So we are funded by Enterprise Ireland and the IDA, and we sit in two universities, in UCD and in DIT. UCD, we have the headquarters, but we have collaborators in both universities. The fact that we sit in university doesn't mean that we do only research. Everything we do is applied research, so more towards industry. So our goal is just to help with the challenges that industry faces. So we work in AI, obviously, but big data analytics, technologies like machine learning, big data, predictive analytics, real-time analytics, deep learning, it will be the future of AI, deep learning, so we're putting a lot of emphasis in that, and blockchain, okay? So we have kind of like a model of member companies, so we work with a lot of companies in different verticals. Um, we have, for example, as you see, big consulting firms, we have Accenture there, we also have Optum in there, so multinationals there. We also have uh, Johnson Johnson, who will be presenting later. Uh, electricity, Siemens, top companies. And at the moment, I think we have 50% multinationals and the other 50% SMEs. So the idea is just that these company members come and get the benefits of CEDAR. We, we can work with other companies as well. But they benefit from these companies. They benefit from uh, meetings that we have, regular meetings, regular events, so big meetings where they can do a lot of networking. We talk about data analytics, we talk about, I don't know, GDPR, any kind of area which is related. And they do a lot of network, which is very good. Then they also benefit from accessing funding. So there's a lot of mechanisms to get funding, enterprise selling and so on. So when they liaise with us, we prepare the projects and then we access the funding. We leverage this funding for, for them. And then we have more than 40 prototypes that we have developed over the years. And these prototypes arise as a necessity or as, um, like as a pro proposition of the challenges that the industry faces. So our companies vote and they say, this is the main challenge, and then we go and execute them. And we build that as a prototype, and all our member companies can actually use them. Okay? So these are all the benefits that we provide. So now, uh, so Industry 4.0. So what is Industry 4.0? I just put a collection of... Um, kind of big words there, which I think encapsulates a lot of things, you know, that Industry 4.0 is, is just trying to achieve. So connectivity, sort of IoT, everything has to be connected. Sending data, monitoring what happens in the factory, and also acting. Uh, predictability, prediction is everywhere, predicting processes, predicting machinery is failing. Personalization, and that's one of the projects that we were trying to work on, that we are working on, which is basically, if I want this jacket to be developed with this thing here, here, or this particular item, everything has to change in the, in the factories, to actually be very agile and develop personalized products. So this is the change, this is the paradigm shift. Optimization of the whole process, for example, at shop level, manufacturing level, supply chain, so putting all of these elements together and optimize it. And that brings me to the decentralization, because now we're going from decentralized to decentralized, I will touch on this later. Adaptability and obviously sustainability in a lot of areas. So, this is just a typical slide. So uh, obviously, Industry 4.0, for those who don't know, 4.0 is the fourth revolution. So there was one, the first one in 1784, which was based on the, when the steam power came, the water power, the mechanization. You all know that. That was in Great Britain. Then, around you know, 80 years later, or well, well, 1870, uh, that was Industry 2.0. And that was the introduction of electricity into the factories. So everything changed mass production, and the conveyor belt was created then. Then, in 1969, Industry 3.0, and that was due to the electronics, the computers, the Apple was around there, and automation. And that was the first uh, PLC was created then there, which is PLCs are like the, the basis of, of all these factories. 
And then finally, in 2011, at the Hanover Messe, which is this huge trade fair in, in Germany, the concept of Industry 4.0 was introduced. And that was a German strategy for just improve high tech in industries. So that was presented there, and it's all about digitization in the whole uh, supply chain and you know, manufacturing. And it relies on the cyber, cyber physical system, so the sensors and the connectivity, the IoT. Okay? Obviously, autonomous robots, machine learning, and big data. So, but just, I like this definition here, Industry 4.0. So, it says the combination of new technologies and organization of labor, so labor is important here, to push this manufacturing into a new realm of optimization. So, technologies, uh, labor, and optimization. So, it's a trend that focuses on creating smart factories through innovative communication and design between machines and humans. So, there is emphasis in optimization, in communication, in labor, and in the interaction of people, the staff that work there, with the processes and with the um, factory. So the human has an important component there, even though everything is smart factories, smart advanced manufacturing, these are concepts, you know, intelligent factories, factories of the future. The human or the staff has a, a particular importance there. And then we are going towards a more competitive, sustainable, and smarter production. That's obvious. And I was mentioning that we are changing the paradigm from a centralized to decentralized smart manufacturing. So now we have these big, you know, manufacturing companies that they do it all. But we are going to go into this model where you develop this piece, you develop this piece, everything is ensembled here. You don't rely on that. The supply chain is super well coordinated and scheduled and optimized that you, you know that this part will arrive here and it will be ensembled here. So that's, 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 that actually represents a lot of tricky processes there that have to be addressed. With regards to the technology pillars that will enable this technology, we have obviously autonomous robots everywhere. Simulation, you might have heard about the zero defect prototyping. Now with simulation, you can have like even you design a whole manufacturing process, sorry, or, or a factory, the robots, you know, the processes, everything, simulate it, check if it's gonna fail, and then just implement it. So zero defect prototyping is kind of, is kind of an interesting area these days, same as the digital twins, which actually represent digitally what you have in the, in the factory. So you can play with that, and you don't, you don't risk money or, or, or resources. System integration, horizontal integration, so all the process horizontally and vertically integrated. So from the subfloor down to the management, everything has to be integrated to optimize the whole processes. Uh, Internet of Things, key for monitoring and acting, cybersecurity, if we don't put an effort in that, the whole concept will disappear, that's, uh, that's key. Cloud computing, against, for example, what you were saying, edge computing there. So there's a dilemma here, you go fully cloud, you go edge, a little bit of edge, and then cloud. Well, we can debate about that. Uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, so good that you have this 3D printing machine and you need this piece and it's broken and you don't have to depend on someone to send it to you, you can have it ready there to try different things. And then augmented reality, the new interfaces, and, uh, and then obviously big data. And on big data, I'm going to touch a little bit here, because uh, according to McKinsey, for example, they say that the, in, in Industry 4.0, the next phase in the digitization of the manufacturing sector is driven by this for disruption. The first one is the interaction with human machine, like augmented reality systems, like we saw. The second one is improving these transfer instructions to the physical world, so advanced robotics and 3D printing. And the last two are due to the rise in data volumes and then computational power, and then the big data analysis. So there's a big emphasis in that that every company should actually uh, embrace. So what is predictive maintenance? Predictive maintenance is a particular area within the whole industry 4.0, and it's actually a very important and big area to take care of. Um, basically, predictive maintenance looks at predicting when any kind of machinery is going to fail or is going to have a fault. And obviously, the goal is reduce downtime, and if you reduce downtime, downtime, you increase the productivity, and ob obviously you reduce the overall cost. So that's pretty logical. Everyone wants that. So up until now, there were different maintenance strategies. Like from centuries, you know, they were just uh, from centuries and hundred, hundred years ago. Or so they were just using the corrective maintenance, and still they use it now. You wait when it breaks, we'll fix it. Obviously, they are, this is not optimum. Then and the other one is just the plan maintenance. So according to this machine, you know that it's going to have. It might fail here, it might fail there, it might fail there. So you do this maintenance schedule uh, over the time. But sometimes it happens before, sometimes it doesn't happen. So, uh, happen. so at the end of the day, everyone is going, or everyone should be going towards the predictive maintenance approach. Predicting what is going to fa fail by monitoring and the condition monitoring. The thing is, 
there's uh, predictive maintenance is good, but the future is proactive maintenance, which is basically, you don't, you don't predict that it's going to fail. You predict that it's going to change and it's going to have an impact, and then you adapt so it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Okay? So the goal is just that there's no maintenance. Obviously, at some point, you'll have to replace something. <laughs> but anyway. So the architecture of a project like in predictive maintenance might have uh, the next following steps, data collection, aggregation, and big data analytics. Uh, when I approach these projects, we end up you know, in the kind of data aggregation and data analysis in CEDAR. But it is key to address the data collection point. The type of sensors that you use, the sampling rate, how fast you sample, because sometimes you know, people want to sample, I don't know, every, every, sec every millisecond or every 10 milliseconds, and there's no need for that, okay? Uh, then networking, whether it's wired, wireless, and that will depend that you will get a lot of data loss, whether that is a requirement for real-time streaming and real-time acting, that complicates the times, if we have to, the things, if we have to process the data in real time. Battery powered, many people are actually using sensors battery powered with wireless connectivities, and they have to realize that they need a maintenance strategy itself on the battery because to replace it and to see when it actually goes down. Security as well. And then on data aggregation, databases, which databases you're using, or is it a SCADA system, or how is the data stored? And the other thing is just in-premises versus cloud, edge computer versus you know, cloud computing different approaches there. And then in big data analytics, we do a lot of data preparation, a lot of statistics, feature engineering, which is one of the main tasks, and machine learning. So for the machine learning, this is very basic, obviously, but uh, for predictive maintenance, we use a combination of classification, regression. You can even use reinforcement learning for this, but we basically use classification for label data, so the label will be the errors, and then you know, we learn from this historical data label when there are errors, and we try to predict or model the behavior of the machinery, model when it works properly, okay, and then when it doesn't work properly. But then if you want to predict how far in time you have until it breaks, you have to go more with regression. And regression uh, kind of machine learning tools use um, kind of predict you know, the time series, okay? Sorry, I analyze the time series to predict you know, this uh, time to failure. So finally, as an example, um, this is one of the projects that we had. Many of them, some of them are in supply chain. This one, for example, is in energy. So we are trying to predict when wind turbines fail. And this is a crazy area, because these wind turbines are actually quite complex models, uh, sorry, complex structures. And they behave in, they behave in a non-linear way. And then they are also subject to all of these harsh environments. So taking that and modeling this is, is, is kind of tricky. So it is important you know, to model that right, to actually send the engineers there to have a look and maintain you know, the system. Because some of them are offshore. They have to actually prepare a boat, pick the blade, go there. If there is a storm, they cannot go. So the sooner they, ha they have it, the better for them. And that's what we work on. So at the end of the day, the goal is minimize downtime and avoid the faults in these components. So basically, we get the data from the SCADA system. We just model it, you know, analyze every kind of sensors. Some of them are not good. Some of them are just a combination of them might actually provide good modeling. We do a lot of data exploration. And one thing that we do, we rely on the data. We just look at, you know, what the data tells us when, when we model it. But we also incorporate, you know, the domain expertise. So we talk to the engineers just to discover the hints. And we try to incorporate, you know, tips on that. And then we do a lot of, you know, advanced monitoring, just trying to model the behavior. So finally, uh, as remarks, part of the future of Industry 4.0 depends on this advanced data analytics and the Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things. In this area, the predictive and then proactive maintenance is key. Okay? And um, I put you know, this image here, which is from a bridge in Honduras. There was a storm and the river changed as a metaphor of what will happen, I think, you know, to companies that don't embrace this technology. Basically, 60% of companies here, they come and they want to invest. They get very happy, you have this data, but then they might say, okay, well, don't know, and then only 5% invest. So I suppose here is just, I hope you know that for some of the companies don't happen, you know, what happened to this river. Sorry, sorry, to the river, to the bridge. So because it seems to me that the, all the technologies are changing so rapidly that there will be companies like this bridge that will serve no purpose in the very near future. Okay, I hope you like it. Thank you very much.